It's a, a great bill. It's going to bring some great benefits to consumers in New Zealand. Very happy to commend it to the House. Thank you. Honourable Clayton Cosgrove. Mr Speaker, like uh, my colleague Carol Beaumont has said, we will be supporting this legislation and uh, consumer protection legislation is generally supported in a non-partisan way in this House because I know Mr Little Aang is nodding his head. He uh, represents an area where, uh, like many parts of New Zealand, there are particular vulnerabilities for consumers when dealing with, uh, with others. And uh, uh, I can recall, sir, as I said in a speech last week, that uh, in my capacity as Associate Justice Minister, we reformed the whole of the real estate industry because, uh, like many industries, 90% of those people, exceptionally good folks, but uh, in terms of consumer protection, there was a quantum or a percentage of those in that industry that preyed on the vulnerable. And that is the case, sir, and this bill deals with uh, a whole series of sectors in a generic way in a number of pieces of legislation, but it is important that consumers are protected. I did raise during the committee stage that, and did note that with consumer protection legislation, it doesn't matter how many laws you actually pass, there are certain folks in our communities who need um, uh, an upgrade of financial literacy and an educative process that not only promotes the legislation but advises uh, folks in our community, the most vulnerable, of what their rights are and, of course, what their obligations are, but specifically their rights. So I say to the government, and I recall we did not get an answer from the minister during the committee stage, as to what, I think it was Mr Finlayson, who was in the chair at the time, who also happens to be Auditor uh, Attorney General. And I asked him what process, what promotion, what education programs would be put in place once this bill, uh, these bills are put through. And to date, I don't think, that, and I think the record would bear me out, that we haven't got an answer. So I say to the government, it will not be simply good enough to pass this legislation, bang it up on a variety of websites, um, uh, 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 ask those good folks at the Citizens Advice Bureau and Budget Advice and other agencies to do the work for the government. The government, through its agencies, needs to go out and promote this, leg uh, this legislation, educate the masses as to what protections are contained within this legislation, how they are implemented, uh, and what rights people have and how they can protect, use this legislation to protect their position. Because, as I say, there's no point in passing it if we don't educate and promote it and advise people of their rights. I make a, a couple of observations. The last speaker talked about the, um, uh, the, the legislation and its impact on unfair contracts. And, sir, I recall, uh, and looking at the, the bill in the committee, committee stage and the previous speakers going way back um, to uh, um, some years ago, Leanne Delzell was speaking on this, there was the issue that hasn't been dealt with in this legislation in respect of unconscionable conduct. And in the commentary to the bill as per the committee stage, uh, it was noted that although the Australians had implemented unconscionable conduct laws, it was felt that uh, in this legislation it would be omitted until such time as I understand it as a body of case law was built up around uh, said unconscionable conduct and its definition. And I note in the uh, page 14 of the, the then legislation that unconscionable conduct applies where courts consider it unfair or inequitable or, quote, against good conscience, unquote, to allow a party to enforce its contractual rights against another party who is detrimentally affected by an oppressive bargain. An oppressive bargain. The Minister of Consumer Affairs invited the Commerce Committee and those making a decision uh, on the bill to consider whether protections in regard to unconscionable conduct should be added. And it was felt, sir, that, as I say, that that be omitted until a body of law was uh, drawn up uh, or precedent was drawn up in Australia. But it talked about, sir, also oppressive contracts, whether a, a contract was oppressive and therefore could be inflicted on another. And I did ask the Minister, sir, in the committee stage, and it's worth repeating for the record, you may have been in the chair, sir, at the time, whether unconscionable conduct would include, for instance, the conduct of, say, one, the, right, the Honourable John Archibald Banks. And I know, sir, before I'm pulled up by yourself or others, that we cannot talk about the detail of the grave, grave, sir, and graphic difficulties that one, the Honourable John Archibald Banks, is in. 
but because he's before the courts. But we do know the facts, sir, and it's interesting as to whether that or an oppressive contract where you have a willing buyer, willing seller situation, perhaps, sir, we have a situation where money is offered to another and accepted, brown paper bags aside, but not talking about any specific case, whether that would be considered, sir, unconscionable conduct. And Sam Lodoyinga, who is a lawyer, so far more qualified than my good self to, to commentate on this, and I know he's scratching away in the law books on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the laptop as we speak, looking up case precedent in the Commonwealth Courts, or if he's not, he should be, whether he could advise us whether that example of conduct, which we cannot talk about, um, would be considered unconscionable, and therefore, sir, a contractual relationship exists, money changing hands, and whether that could be considered oppressive. I would argue that in relation to the Honourable John Archibald Banks, we will know it's, if it's oppressive once the learned court has rendered a verdict, sir. And uh, he may well be able to write a dissertation, or Mr Goldsmith, uh, you know, through striped sunshine, may be able to add to volume one of Mr Banks's autobiography with volume two. I'm told the Lord Sir Geoffrey Archer, sir, the Lord Sir Geoffrey Archer penned many a volume, many a volume of, uh, of literary works from within Her Majesty's prisons uh, over a number of years. Sir. So we could be in line for another series of literary works from the Honourable John Archibald Banks, one who has been convicted of two crimes, sir, prior to the one we talk about now. So that member, sir, may indeed uh, want to uh, consult this piece of legislation in terms of, of consumer protection, and indeed Mr Dotcom may wish to consult this legislation to determine whether he has any consumer protection or rights, sir, that could be aided and abetted by this learned piece of legislation. But to get back to more substantive parts, uh, given that we've traversed uh, that little episode, I note, sir, that the, uh, and other speakers have, have noted this, again I talked in the last piece of legislation earlier today in taxation about this government's priorities. And we note that this has sort of, you know, initiated in 2009, a review was, June 2010, and discussion document. These are all good processes, sir. The bill introduced to Parliament 2011, first reading 2012 in February, reported back in October, blah, 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 and here we are. Now, these are all appropriate processes for a piece of legislation to go through. The message that I have for this government is that it has taken an inordinate amount of time to get this legislation to the third reading which we are on today, an inordinate amount of time. Minister Foss and I believe Minister Bridges before him, that well-known um, that well-known clamper, what did you say, Mr Clark? Yes, whose claim to fame was wheel clamping when he was Associate Minister of Transport. Uh, those two ministers, sir, there is a pattern. Getting legislation through takes an inordinate amount of time with Minister Foss. And the question is simply this. What is more important than providing people with rights as they go about their daily, and protections as they go about their daily business, sir, transacting uh, or uh, engaging in transactions? And these are the most vulnerable often, sir. Many of us in the House have been around a bit, some over there longer than others. We've had a bit of life experience. Uh, we know what smells bad and what doesn't in terms of basic transactions. Other people don't have that benefit, sir. Other people don't have... I wasn't including Mr Banks in that life experience, uh, colleague. But others do not, and they're vulnerable and they need assistance and they rely on this Parliament to give assistance. So a number of years it has taken to get relatively straightforward legislation through, and you've got to ask yourself, is it asset sales or is it consumer legislation? Is it deals with Rio Tinto themselves, which could be called unconscionable because the, con the uh, taxpayer, of course, got nothing for the 30 million bucks, but with that aside, what is more important and where are the government's priorities? Great, of course, sir, at laying down the law for uh, others, uh, but when it comes to consumer protection and critical pieces of legislation, sir, it can just toddle on, wheedle its way down the, down the path and take its time going through the process in the Parliament. Sir, I submit this is very important legislation. Um, we will be supporting this legislation, and there are probably other ideas, sir, which will flow from this, and I hope Ministers Foss and Bridges and others, sir, will lift their game and ensure that the next round, when there is one, sir, of consumer protection legislation will be expedited and not dragged kicking and screaming through the parliamentary processes. Here, here. 
Mojo made this.